Julia, as you anticipated, the most uh, remarkable and well-known uh, case about the right to be forgotten is the Costeja versus uh, Google Spain case decided by the Court of uh, Justice of the European Union in 2014. Uh, having this in mind, um, uh, what have been the main outcomes and conflicts that arise from these uh, decision in Europe? And uh, despite Google's own interpretation of this decision, uh, what, in your own uh, opinion, in your own view, uh, do you think is the most appropriate way to uh, handle this uh, request, this, this de-indexation request? And uh, what do you consider is the best way to um, um, uh, uh, protect the interests that the, the court decided to wanted to protect? Yeah, so it's been super um, intense, the implementation of the right to be forgotten. There have now been over 500,000 Europeans who have made requests to Google through a form it set up one month after that ruling. So it, Google moved swiftly um, in, in taking on the obligations that it had under this ruling. There are actually some far broader consequences, I think, in terms of what this European ruling said about the application of laws... 20 years, old, 20 years old to companies like Google. They have so far been relatively scot-free in the um, data protection ecosystem and one of the potential reasons why they moved so swiftly with the right to be forgotten was to stop any potential thought about what other elements of the core legal funding, which is that they are a data controller, subject to all sorts of obligations, including, for example, prior to a request in fact, considering data protection obligations. And there's various legal issues, think really interesting research questions around that. But so they implemented fast. The information that they gave to the public, I think, was um, quite limited and potentially misleading. So, so they triggered what was, I think, a, a largely unproductive debate at the very beginning, which was that, oh, look at all of these criminals and public figures and politicians who are raising concerns about the right to be forgotten. And indeed on their transparency report, which they commenced about four months after they started implementing, they used they cited some examples of cases that they accept and reject. And they were predominantly scenarios with of an individual who was a public figure, criminal and so on. A a, um, based on uh, some work with a data scientist, Sylvia Tittman, uh, we did a story in The Guardian a year after that, which disclosed that based on actually an error in Google's own um, behind its transparency report, the source code revealed how Google itself had indexed these requests. And it showed that less than 5% of requests, let alone those that are accepted, come from these categories that they had given prominence to. So I think that totally skewed the interpretation people had, that this was, and, and quite rightly, we would have great difficulty with the idea that people who would be able to repress information that is of public interest, that is about criminal records and so on. In fact, what it allows is really an alignment of what happens online with what happens offline. So the cases involving criminals who do have a right to be delisted are those who meet local laws about rehabilitation of offenders, say. Past crimes, they've served their time, or perhaps they were accused of a crime, subs subsequently were acquitted, and the information continues to percolate without, because of course news being as it is, the news story of someone being accused is often far more interesting than that they are acquitted. So it's a, it's a I regard um, the delisting, rights to delist I think is a better way of interpreting this particular variant. Perhaps we'll talk again about the other other types of rights under this brand of the right to be forgotten. But the particular one in the Google case is a right to be delisted, um, have certain information delisted that's inaccurate, out of date, um, and no longer relevant, and not of public interest. Yeah. So that's how the implementation has been to date. Uh, in terms, you asked how could we do better with this. I actually um, think there there would be really great scope and um, some of the discussions with the local representative of Google here were quite productive, but great scope for more um, nuanced solutions to the issue of somebody's results remaining high in search. So, for example, you could just move it below the first three to four pages of search results. However, these people often don't have much other information, so there isn't a third or fourth page um, about them. But there's ways of, for example, having notifications back to the archive of those news stories. Perhaps um, 
tools to pseudonymize names after a certain period of time. That's something that's pra practiced already in um, media in different countries. And I think one really valuable component, if, if Google had been more transparent, after that study we I, m I mentioned where we found that 95% of requests were personal, we then, uh, I, along with a, a consortium of academics, made a number of requests to Google to say, can we segment the types of requests you're receiving and therefore how we might consider the legal response to them. Because under the right to be forgotten, you have everything from, or right to delist, you have everything from someone's medical information that's online to potentially controversial cases with a news story, for example, where there's also a competing free speech right. And we should totally separate them. Google actually separated one category out, and I know this connects the work of Internet Lab, which is the revenge porn category. So they didn't connect it to the right to delist, but after eight months of enforcement, they announced global delisting of revenge porn requests. And that is the sort of approach I think would be really helpful. So we segment okay, you, you have a broader category. At the moment, they only basically do fraud or um, uh, they, they don't even do things like, in particular countries, it could be very sensitive what your age is or what your, your religion is. Um, so a broader set of categories that are sensitive and that if somebody doesn't want... Because, um, you know, the core of this is the information about me sh I should be able to control when it's not of public interest and there's no competing right. Um, so those categories would be useful to delineate. And then I think if we did that, we would be left with a small proportion of the cases that really do involve publisher interest, going back to that question about the, the genuine interest of these media organisations, ensuring that this, the hard work that they do continues to have an in impact. And perhaps a public-private partnership. Um, Virgilio, I think, supports this idea, and there's a lot of support from, um, for example, David Hoffman at Intel, um, and many researchers in Germany to the idea of a public-private partnership that would look at the requests where there's a genuine conflict, where Google doesn't have experience, where there's case law that might differ between different jurisdictions about the clash between, on the one hand, freedom of expression and um, data protection rights. So I think a segmented approach would be really beneficial, as well as perhaps what this this the, the resounding cry of 500,000-plus Europeans, and I think global citizens, is that it's not good enough if Google can sweep the streets of the web and put whatever they find online, no matter what purpose somebody put that information on. You know, think of a, um, an ex that wants to get back at you and put certain information online. Any manner of reasons why people will put something online, there's no friction to that. And some tools to really get back a little degree of control on that, that vast sweep.